Michael and Branch presidents. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay as my respects to the elders past and present. I'd like to acknowledge uh, friends from the diplomatic court here today, from Mongolia and Iran especially. Well, housing is a hot button issue and uh, these days, and no less in countries in our immediate region as it is in, in this country. There are all sorts of supply and demand solutions being discussed. Uh, so uh, actually, if you're hoping for a quick fix tonight on all of that, I'm sorry, we've come to the wrong place. <laughs> now, our speaker tonight will uh, uh, um, take an in-depth look at the housing market, its benefits, as well as some of the systemic challenges brought about by rapid urbanisation, climate change, and a host of other factors. So I'm looking forward especially to uh, her take on innovative approaches that communities in the Pacific can adopt to address those challenges. It's a pleasure to have with us tonight uh, Dr. Bernadette Pinnell, the Global Business Director of Home in Place Limited. Bernadette's uh, joined, joined Home in Place, which is an Australian NGO focused on affordable housing in 2015. And amongst other things, she's working on a public-private partnership project to deliver 3,000 affordable homes in the Pacific. The partners in that are the Fiji government and the International Finance Corporation. As, as you'll no doubt hear shortly, Bernadette grew up in Northern Ireland. She has established businesses in New York, uh, UK, PNG, Sydney, and New Zealand. After 15 years in Sydney, she, she returned to New Zealand be part of the Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Authority, following the earthquake there, which, as you recall, the story of 2011. Yeah, 2011 indeed. But later, she established an affordable housing organisation, Compass Housing New Zealand, and uh, Bernadette's chaired the Urban Development Institute of New Zealand as well. Now, in 2022, uh, Bernadette was awarded Westpac's New Zealand Woman of Influence. And I uh, understand busy at the moment with a global Indigenous housing conference in Hawaii coming up. So uh, without any further ado, that's the end of the housekeeping. Mm -hmm. As per our normal format, Bernadette will speak for, how, how long do you think, Bernadette? 30 minutes. 30 minutes would be great. And uh, we'll take some questions after that from the floor and uh, those of you who are online. Uh, and we aim to finish at 7 p.m. So over to you, Bernadette. Thank you very much. Um... Yeah, look, Kaizen has been a lived experience for me growing up in Northern Ireland. I don't know if any of you see the Dairy Girls, Netflix yes. TV series. Mm -hmm. I'm a Dairy Girl. Good. And that was my lived experience, you know, yeah. growing up in Northern Ireland in the 70s and 80s. And um, and so housing was really the kind of foundation, and it is the foundation for everybody. And so, you know, in Home and Place, our, our vision is that everyone has a right to adequate and affordable housing and to live in sustainable communities. And, and that's that just resonates with me and it's the longest employment I've ever been in with one organization because I really believe in what we do and, and why we do it, which is actually just as important. So um, we're, you know, been around Australia for 39 years um, and, but there's so much more needed to be done. And so we're not complacent about where we are today. Um, and I guess, you know, the shifting focus and, and purpose of housing has changed, you know, from being shelter, which is, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs to, to being a commodity because there's so many multiple advantages to it, you know, in terms of um, it's, a, it's a whole economy, you know, it's the economy of buying and selling houses and the materials that go into uplifting and upgrading and then TV programs, um, you know, so that the, the shelter aspect of housing has really kind of been left behind. Um, and also, as, you know, having a strong home and having tenure security and having the ability to know where you're going to go to school, where you're going to work, where your health center is, you know, where your fam family and friends are, is really, really important for so many other, many other aspects of, of what we do in our daily lives, you know, from education to employment and, and things like that. And so, and then just that security of tenure is something that's actually gone quite a bit now. So either, you know, people are mortgaging themselves to the hilt, which is giving them a lot of insecurity because they don't know how long they can sustain the mortgage repayments that they're paying or the rents that they're currently paying. And there's a real hidden ep epidemic now of older women who earn less money all of their lives and have lower superannuation. And that is the new hidden homelessness. Um, and so, um, you know, a lot of these kind of aspects are, are then being masked by the intergenerational transfer of wealth. So this is the biggest intergenerational transfer of wealth that the world is experiencing. And Australia and New Zealand are a little bit behind in demographics of 
you know, the US and Germany and Japan. But, you know, if you look at the sheer scale of that and the fact that people are hanging on to houses that they can't really live adequately in anymore because like they're three bedrooms and they only need one bedroom, but they don't want to give it up because so, you know, that kind of economic aspect of it is, is something. Um, um, and, all, and then people are using their houses to fund businesses, you know, and so it's, you know, what I call that kind of commodification of housing has lost our whole kind of purpose of, of what housing really should be about. Um, and if I move to the Pacific, which is the purpose of this evening, it's actually magnified there because they don't have that security of tenure. They don't have the land security. The tenure of land is, is something that they don't have. So they have traditional land and they've got land that's kind of um, allocated as under trusts and things like that. But And also women don't have the land rights. So if, if they're married and their, hus or their husband dies, they're then, then actually reliant on other family, male family members to enable them to continue to live in the house that they live in because they don't have that tenure security. So I think that factor plus um, the, the sheer percentage of what's called informal settlements or slums. And I think it's really important not to conflate slums and the people because they didn't choose to live, like I didn't choose to grow up where I did, or you didn't choose to grow up where you did. But there is very little opportunities for them to get out of those because of that land tenure, but also because of the land itself, the capability of the land. Um, and now, the, you know, increase in sea level rise. Um, and, you know, I've recently come back from Solomon Islands where you have these villages and there's 500 people living in the village and they're between the highway. There's one road, major road in Hamira, and uh, the sea wall. And so every time there's a storm, it gets eroded, you know, their ablution blocks get eroded, you know, the front of the primary school gets eroded, the front of the kindergarten gets eroded, and they've got nowhere to go. You know, so that is, is something. And so, and then there's the other kind of language of squatter settlement. So I think the use of some of these terms is actually um, degrading, you know, what it is that the fundamental need is. It makes it sound like they're choosing these things. And so it's really, really important not to conflate the people and the problem. Um, and then the sheer, you know, scale of population. Uh, you know, I, I lived in Papua New Guinea. And, and now it, it breaks my heart to think there's 10 million people in Papua New Guinea. And they do not have housing. You know, they really don't have a housing infrastructure. Um, and and then the Solomon Islands, you know, lack of financial resources and mechanisms. You know, the, again, the land tenure issue is is really fundamental. And and organisations like the United Nations used to do a lot of um, funding into housing, but it's kind of dropped off the radar because it's actually quite expensive. And so they're focusing on other things like energy and things like that, where they get runs on the board as a result of less money, you know, for their outputs. And I guess they're being measured by outputs. So, you know, and I think, you know, the consequences of this is that kind of geopolitical competition because then the Pacific Islands are kind of sitting there and saying, well, who's going to give us, you know, who's going to give us something? And so they're kind of now being bartered for, you know, the, for their fundamental need. And that's kind of resulting in disenfranchisement. So it's disenfranchisement for them their ability to believe that they will actually improve where they currently live, they'll improve their kind of circumstances because there is no roadmap for them. And so, you know, that's that's really an important um, aspect of, of, you know, the sector that maybe some of you are in here in, in, in Australia. So it'll be interesting to kind of unpack, you know, what I'm saying and how you feel it resonates or doesn't resonate or solutions. and. And the whole idea of, you know, the PPP transaction is that it is designed to bring houses in, but now that's even become a competitive kind of jurisdiction between countries that you can imagine who would be buying to kind of use that mechanism to get in and actually put a footprint in. There's 3,000 houses, it's quite a lot. Um, but there's actually 30,000 houses needed in Fiji. And to be fair to Fiji, they've actually set up um, a trust fund for the resettlement programs that they need to do. Um, but it's insufficient for what they need to do. And, you know, I've been tracking one village called the Navavaji village, which has over 300 people, and they've been living, their land was damaged. They were not of the tribe of the land adjacent to them, so they couldn't just simply move. So they've been living in, you know, a marquee tent for over three years now. So you put yourself in that situation, you know, your family, your extended family, your children, whatever, and you're living in a tent with three toilet blocks and three shard, three shard blocks. What's the intergenerational consequences of that kind of 
um, living situation. Um, so, and I think that's the kind of contextual thing, but actually it's not the worst thing that's happening. You know, the worst thing is actually happening is sea level rise and, and climate changes and climate events. <laughs> and it's not about a believer or not believer. I mean, the data is there, the metrics are there. We already know they're happening and, and they're in the canary in the coal mine. You know, the Pacific Island is the canary in the coal mine in terms of the heat waves that they're experiencing, the, um, the frequency of, of climate events and the damage that's being caused by that. And what that actually means then is, you know, obviously the obvious things of heat and flame and heats and fires, frequency of those events, the intensity of those events, then the damage to the food, the damage to the water, the damage to the sea, um, you know, frequent power and internet blackouts, you know, you just think of what we do in our daily life and you put yourself in a situation without that power, without that water, without that security. How do you actually get up each day? You know, how do you function? How do you achieve? How do you um, aspire? You know, so all of that, you know, is kind of being taken from them, not because they chose that, but it's because, um, you know, that's what's, what is their, what they're facing. And then that, you know, the health impacts of, of children and elders and us, you know, like we're facing it here in Australia and we're facing it in New Zealand, we're facing it around the world. And so that's kind of what the consequences will be for all of us. It's just, it's more advanced for them um, and they have less, um, they have less tools. And the whole idea of, you know, climate refugees and, and what our tolerance is going to be for that, um, again, for people, because they don't have anywhere to live. That's the foundation, the, you know, the fundamental premise. Um, and, and that's just a new form of human settlement. Insecurity is the new form of, of, of human settlement. So, you know, from where we were to where we kind of got to probably in the 60s, 70s, 80s, um, we're now in a new form of human settlement, which is temporary, which is transient, transient and where there is no security. And so then that has significant impacts on health, education, employment, and economic development. Um, and then climate displacement, like what is our passion? What is our sympathy towards people who are coming into this country or coming into other countries? Um, they're kind of being labeled now, you know, as being people who chose to come in, you know, and, and you hear these, all these kind of stories. Um, and then this kind of growth of an, an informal economy. Um, so it is amazing to see the trading and bartering that does go on in these um, informal settlements, you know, their ability to, um, you know, the village in, in Solomon Islands, they, they didn't even have any wood, but they managed to cook. And so, you know, you go to this village, there's smoke everywhere, but they're cooking on Sunday because they're selling it in the market on Monday. And so, and, um, and actually making enough money then to buy, you know, other supplies and food and clothes and things like that. Um, so I think that's the preparation that we need to kind of prepare ourselves for, for the kind of tra trajectory of housing or, or the lack of housing. Um, and so this kind of new terminology of the unsettled, you know, so housing isn't security anymore. It's, it's, it's not a settlement anymore, it's unsettled. We don't know how long we're gonna be able to live there. You know, and even in Australia, you experience it, you know, you experience it from sea level rise, in places like like Macquarie or um, in other as you know in other places, um, so you know fifty percent of the Pacific population live in coastal settlements. So again, their their land is lower and the sea level is rising, um, and then the consequences of that is you know impaired cognitive development and under nutrition and under education, um, you know the harm that comes from from these events, um, limited access to health and education. Um, and then the loss of dignity and human right. So again, it's all because of the price. You know, it's the foundation. Um, but, you know, we've, we continue to, to evolve and we continue to can come up with new ways. And, and these are just some of the ones that, that I'm aware of. Is the modular solution um, is a way of getting houses built faster. But it does need a lot of regulation. And in Christchurch, that was the thing, you know, it was 10,000 houses. But when we brought in the kind of modular model, and so these, the blue things, basically are containers, but they look just exactly as they seem. And so, but inside that container is the kitchen and the, you know, the lounge and the cabinetry. Um, so you can see, you know, really high quality. It's even got the fridge and the oven and, well, the fridge, not, the fridge isn't at the door for the fridges, but the, 
you know, the other bit of, and then the bathroom, you know, so that you know, really kind of fast tracks the length of time it takes, but you still have to go through the accreditation and the compliance processes. And so in Christchurch, we ended up having to do time-lapse photography just so that the compliance officers could see, you know, how these things were. Um, and so all the electrical wiring is, is in the ceiling. And so the, you just have to get a local electrical uh, and the local electrical contractor and a plumber to kind of check, you know, all the systems. So it's definitely a, it's definitely a systemic change. And there's um, organizations that are doing it here in Australia, but it's not mainstream just yet. Um, and good old IKEA is getting into it. You know, they're actually doing quite a bit of this um, in Europe in particular. And so, you know, so if it becomes more mainstream and it becomes more at scale, then um, there's hope that, you know, some of these kind of alternative solutions to building houses, because the process of building a house is so inefficient. You know, you get them, they're all bespoke. You need the architect, you need the engineer, you need the, you know, the planning consents. They need the plumbers, the electricians. You know, it's amazing how complex we've made building a house. And that's part of what's led to the expense. But, you know, more and more of these, you know, solutions um, will, will help with that process. Um, and then, you know, the, the nature problem. Um, so this is an example from the Netherlands where they're actually building floating terraces. I'm not sure if it's obvious. I mean, they look like they're just kind of pontoons. But actually, it's a real it's a real solution, and and they are doing that. And then, and the one in the middle is actually Seattle, which is probably more. I mean, when I met Sally, <laughs> it's a bit old, but um, but yeah, they've been around for a long time, and so that's a way of just kind of adjusting for the changes in sea level rise. And then, and this is a real project in the Maldives. Um, so they're, you know, they're actually doing this model of building on the water. And then you can see that they're actually not bringing it into the middle of the city. They won't be attached into the city, but they sit on a kind of um, buoyancy system. So that's a way of trying to stop controlling for changes in sea level and actually going with them. And so, you know, that's the thing. Like we we do kind of keep evolving and we do try different things. And so, um, that yeah, this is just kind of one of, of many ways or, or a couple of many ways of particularly dealing with water. Um, and then the Republic of Nauru has 11,000 and um, Australia, as, as you were, had the, um, the centre there. And so they have now taken that land back. And so because of climate change, they're having to move. And you can see from, from this map, you know, the areas that would be prone to flooding. And so there, there's a kind of internal mobilisation of people to higher ground. Um, and so... And they're using their own public funding. And so, you know, that's another thing as well is to use some of the provident funds that are already existing in the US or uh, in the in the Pacific, um, to use some of that private public sector money um, and commerce and private sector um, and philanthropic funding. So there's not one solution, it's actually kind of looking more kind of holistically and pulling all the, the pieces of the thread together. And then building new industries and economy. So um, you know, this is to be commended because they are self-funded. Um, so it's still on the planning stages, but it's good to see that kind of initiative. And so, you know, just kind of highlighting that and, and amplifying that for others to kind of look at it as a solution, not always looking outside and saying, who's going to give us some money? Who's going to help fund it? But actually using some of that internal funding within, the, within their own country. Um, and then this is a, another project that we're involved in, which is about using remittance. And so it's interesting, you know, when you look at the, the stats, to see the sheer level of GDP that actually comes from the remittance. Um, and so in the Pacific in particular, um, it's actually three times more than official development assistance. And so, you know, that really kind of strikes a chord in terms of what the potential for this is. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's, it's a bit of a work in progress, but it's, again, just a way of thinking differently. Um, and using kind of more kind of social capital ideas and knowledge of the people, the you know the expats. Um, so using their kind of external skills from the countries that they've gone to and their thinking, because you know when we look at the problem within the Pacific, we think, well, we'll show them the, what the solutions are, but we actually don't go to the diaspora and ask them, what are the skills and knowledge that you've learned? What are the what are the capabilities that you now have from being wherever you are in the world? 
that you could bring back. And so maybe kind of bringing that kind of forum together, um, you know, is something that we should, you know, we really should be considering in terms of just dismissing that we have the solutions that we bring it to them. Um, and then working on different, um, you know, financial vehicles, you know, to make this work, you, can, you need the financial institutions, you need the technical you need, and the growth of technology. And there are some amazing changes that are happening as a result of, of technology changes in terms of even in the construction industry, but also in the, in the kind of financial industry. And then remittance service providers and then NGOs. So at the minute, it's a, you know, it's a, a bit of a proof of concept, but, but there, are, there are actual examples of projects and, and there is some guidance from the UN on this approach as well. So that's my spiel. So I'm interested in that's kind of oh, thank you very stimulated much. any yeah. sure, be a question. Maybe I could just ask uh, first of all, uh, how do you get your message across? Uh, basically, you must uh, you all these great ideas and various solutions, more coming up. Uh, how, how do you bring that to the attention of presumably leaders in these countries in those parts of the world. Mm. Uh, do you have to attend meetings or do you have to yeah. get on in the, you know, under the eyes of the United Nations or? Yes, people, that's a, that's a really good question. Group or whatever it is? Yeah, so we so we are accredited with um, ECOSOC. Um, so I, I just submitted my paper yesterday to the, um, the, um, the review that's coming up in July in, in New York. I mean, the thing is, it's such a big beast. It's hard to kind of, you know, to make a make a voice. But if you don't, you have to try. So we put forward, you know, our kind of perspective on it. We are registered with ECOSOC, so we're registered as a um, on, in consultative status. So we have the right to come to the higher level forum and have our voices heard. We're part of the Pacific Urban Partnership, which has UN and NESCAP and the UN Habitat programs. Um, and so that's a good forum, and it's a good conduit between the Pacific Island Forum Secretariat. And so every two years we host a conference. Um, and so the last one was in Fiji, and we had 500 people there. And so we we you know we brought some of these topics to the fore, and we brought the topic of the Indigenous housing. So we have an Indigenous housing theme. So we had Māori from New Zealand, and we had Aboriginal housing office from um, Victoria from Canada. Um, and so. The idea of kind of bringing together a global indigenous housing conference so we could look at indigenous approaches to housing solutions as well. But I think, you know, really building on the capability and the skills that sit within the Pacific Island Forum and empowering and enabling them and, and giving not just funding, but giving resources so that it, it, you kind of bolster them because, you know, their tenures change and so that knowledge goes as soon as the tenure changes and things like that. So. So that's and then persistence, you know, and um, and establishing relationships and working hard to, you know, I'm passionate for what we do. Like I really believe what we do, so it's easy because I'm very persistent. So you the Davos Forum might go to Australia, either. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, the pro there's a lot now coming from um, the um, the NGO and philanthropic funding and also impact funding. So you know, we've worked with impact investors. We've done PPP transactions. And I think you know the government in Australia has has kind of shifted that as well from from the you know from ten years ago where it was just you were an organisation you got some government government funding and you tried to do what you could do now you know we're commercial you know we've gone through PPP transactions the House in Australia Finance Fund has been amazing because it's helped refinance the not for profit organisations but I think you know the other thing we need to consider in the Pacific and and you can see it is that there's a young generation of like twenty year olds who are educated. And they don't have any way to get into the housing market to get into that commodity. And so we keep looking at them as the problem in the slums and things like that. But actually, just there is nobody building housing in the Pacific for, for people who, you know, who actually have some money. Um, the Fijian government have the affordable housing fund um, and they're currently rewriting their housing policy. And we're working with them to do an implementation of policy because sometimes policies are great and MFATs, you know, from being providing funding for them to. To, to upgrade their policies, but then it sits as a policy and they don't know how to disaggregate it. And what does it mean? So, you know, like we have this big structure, but if we can just break it down, give them bite-sized pieces that they can all kind of work towards. So multi, multi-functional tasks. Never a dull moment. Uh, questions, please. Yes, Lynn. Uh, Melbourne, Lisa, um, in your last slide, you spoke about the 
important sort of specific diasporas for businesses and can you capitalize from them? What role you saw for what Australia's specific labor schemes in addressing housing? Um, I don't know what, I don't know enough about the actual program, about how, how long it works and what security that they have. I mean, you hear kind of mixed stories about what their experience has been like in terms, and I think it's hopefully changing because of, you know, employment rules and regulations. But um, you might be able to identify some opportunities that you can think, because I don't know enough about the program itself. Well, I guess you've got 10 countries in the Pacific that have temporary access to the Australian Open Market, so they can come out here and work for anything between nine months and three years, and that's how long you can get to traditionally. Um, need workers in various other industries, aged care, that have been identified as progress in Australia. And so, my own experience being close to the Pacific is that people have not worked in these projects in Australia and much of the standard housing in the other people in villages. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, when a, when a cyclone goes through Tonga, go and look at that village, the houses that are still standing generally belong to the people that have participated in yeah. overseas work schemes, not just in Australia. Zealand as well. So I just wondered, you know, whether that might play a key role in both exposing people to. Yeah, you know, yeah. Like, and I, and then so we're currently doing a peer to peer relationship with the Pacific, uh, with the Public Rental Board in Fiji. And one of the things we're doing is in Australia and New Zealand, we have the public, we have the Māori Pacifica Trade Training Centre. So we're kind of introducing them to them. And then Auckland University has a centre for Pacific architecture. And so kind of linking them into those to kind of keep that, not just like a one hit, go and see what they do, but actually keeping that kind of connection between them and then trying to build that kind of skills and capability and probably trying to, like what we're trying to do is to create a kind of seed fund so that for these, like just this proof of concept is to bring them over and to provide them some with some training to kind of stay in touch with them and then and then help for them to bring them back. I mean, the thing in, in Solomon Islands and that I've noticed, particularly in PNG, you see it as well, is they do have those trade skills. You know, they don't have the materials or they don't, but they do have the skills. And I think it's maybe kind of amplifying some of those skills and, and making them believe that they can take them back and do something with it. But I think when they go back, they need something to stay with them um, so that they do stay connected. Because what happens is they go back, and it's funny because I've met people, you know, who especially when I say I live in New Zealand, they say, oh, you know, I, I went to New Zealand for three months or six months or whatever. But then they don't think that there's, you know, that there's things that they can transfer back because they come back into that context and they think it's not the same. So I don't know what I can offer in that new kind of context. So it could be a good kind of pilot project, to you know, just to test. Maybe with the university. So, yeah, reach out to me and I'm happy to see what we can make it work. So for us as an organization, there's two aspects to our business. One is that we manage tenancies and the other is that we provide asset management. And so that kind of tenant property management kind of skills means we have the trades in house. And so that's what we're doing with them is learning from them and, and building our trades up as well. And so, um, and then working with the universities and, and then maybe, maybe trying to get them some kind of accreditation process, which is what the Maori Pacific Trade Training Center does. Okay, Desmond. Today's news was that Vanuatu and Australia have struck an agreement, a one part of which relates to the relocation of people who are in the situation mm -hmm. you described, mm -hmm. uh, which is pretty sobering. Um, I was thinking as you were speaking about this, the relative scale of the problem, what you're seeing is imminent and a, and a dreadful threat to those people who are facing sea level rise in the Pacific. But I'm also aware that Jakarta mm -hmm. is a city of tens of millions. Mm -hmm. The government is withdrawing itself and the civil service to a, a new site in Kalimantan. Very few people will be going there. Mm -hmm. It's very the, glitzy, isn't it? The, sorry? The new center that- mm -hmm. That's right, yeah. in Borneo, leaving the entire city of Jakarta mm -hmm. uh, built by the Dutch on a bog, mm -hmm. uh, we're faced with the most appalling future problems of, mm. of, uh, of inundation, which is becoming more regular. Uh, my question actually relates not so much to that as to the whole business of um, resort development. Mm. Yeah. Now, on the one hand, you know, resorts bring jobs, they bring capital, they bring money, they attract uh, tourists who spend. Uh, but on the other hand, 
the building of those resorts presumably is at the expense of doing other things with the same materials and skills mm -hmm. or would they not get built of those resorts worth building what's your thinking about well a lot of labor comes in from overseas and they build those resorts you know, yes with overseas so labor and, and then they go back yeah that's right and i mean there's you know there's a, a definite trend particularly in nandi you know where you see expats that have already kind of bought land um to go go retire there and so yeah. then they'll have that parallel universe you know because they won't actually interact with yeah. the locals they'll live in a and their enclave, you know, yes. so that's the thing. We'll have a, a parallel world, um, but particularly with that kind of intergenerational change of wealth. You know, yes. um, it's true in Cyprus, has been there recently, and there's a much larger British population in Cyprus than in the days when I was part of what is it, British mm -hmm. colony. Uh, so, on balance, do the governments where tourism is still growing welcome that development, or is it really at the expense of what they'd rather be doing? Um, I think the governments are just so happy to see anything happening. Um, yeah. And also, you know, it's interesting even in terms of, you know, some of the conversations we've had with the Australian government, because in this PPP transaction, is, that, is this recorded? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, either, you know, the idea of this PPP transaction is that if an Australian, New Zealand kind of company could win that transaction, there would be a different kind of dynamic from it. But it was interesting to see that you know, other countries are not willing to prevent some of these projects happening or mm -hmm. speak out against them because they think, well, it's progress. You know, as you say, you know, some of the benefits are there. You know, they do sell products in there. They do, you know, sell food in there and things like that. So is it fair to say that you can't have that because yeah. we think you shouldn't? Yeah. You know, so that's... that's the about, job's a job. That's right. And some of them might rise to the top, you know, and some of them may have, you know, developed skills overseas that they wouldn't come back to because those jobs don't exist. But if new kind of resorts are, I mean, you know, there's so many other services like the health sector that's needed, the education yeah. sector that's needed, you know, there's so many other kind of skills that are needed. Um, and so, I, and I think, you know, that kind of health resort model will, will become a new thing as well in the Pacific. But people go in there similar to other kind of countries where they go and recuperate or they get treatments done or whatever. So. But we need to build more housing around that yeah. for that to happen, you know. And so, um, and you know, one of the programs that we do in Australia, New Zealand, it's called employment related accommodation. So, if young people, because the thing is, if they don't have any employment or training by the time they're twenty five, then the stats will show that they will never be employed. Yeah. And so that not an employment and training cohort. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we provide housing for them. So you know, you go and work with Lendlease or Stockland or whatever equivalent, and so. Yeah, they have to kind of come, so especially more in low income households and more low income kind of areas. You know, they go in, they've given them, they've had to psychosocially pull away from that network of worklessness to say, I'm going to try and get a job. And then they go over there, they go in, the foreman yells at them and they're like, well, I'm not going back, you know. Mm -hmm. And so having them in the house is we have somebody in the house that says, put your big boy pants on and get back tomorrow, you know, and keep going back and keep persisting and keep doing it. And it's made a fundamental change because that now they have security of that, you know, so they can fail and they cannot fall completely out of the system, but fail and learn and fail and learn, which is what we all do. So. And so using houses for those, housing for those kind of different things would be really great. And so making sure they've got proper housing when they do come here and, sh and then see what proper housing looks like and how can, you know, and maybe just focusing on them as a cohort and, and, and making sure they, when they come here to get those employment opportunities that maybe they learn other skills and and we stay with them stay engaged with them and that actually might be a, a better form of development aid than some of the money that aid projects that go you know that go in there so uh, um thank you this has been really interesting um but a, a comment there's a lot of really good ecotourism projects happening sure. um particularly in Maori down the coast of Maori province in PNG, there's a brilliant one which is right near across the water from there. The big uh, leatherback turtles come in and lay their eggs on it. Mm -hmm. Now we go on. Um, there's a lot of low key things. So, we, uh, tourism is not just about big resorts, but we think of that with Fiji, which, from my experience, is the most racist of the uh, Pacific Island nations and also the one where it's very much welfare mentality. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I was going to ask you about your, because um, it's so complex. Um, I've seen some amazing buildings put in there by the tax program in, in PNG. I mean, you know, people put in the mines, put in great buildings, people mm. put in good buildings. 
They're not cyclone proof. They blow away. Mm -hmm. um, they're not designed. Um, the, the communities don't look after them because they're not consulted. And we see that a lot with also um, Australian aid programs that they, they get put in, unfortunately. And maintenance as well. Australia put it in or yeah. Rotary put it in or someone else stuck it in there. We won't ask. We don't maintain it. Yeah. It's up to them. So there's been a long decades of this going on. Um, but it was the, the the urban drift. You talked about the Solomon Islands and the Honey Island. I'm just wondering whether that's the Malaitans coming in, whether that's Western Province and, and Choisel. Are people coming in looking for place? Because as we know, the, the way that they look at land and use land, the Guadalcanal, they mm -hmm. use it quite differently mm -hmm. to the others and then very resistant to people there. Yeah. Port Moresby, yes. Um, originally, Kahola, Karabasia, um, Barocco and the suburb I cannot think of, which is out the back of Waigani, where the Gualas the all went, mm. were all designed for homes for people working in Port Moresby. Mm. But then that seemed to stop um, some years ago. And you've still got all the squatters behind, well, down Koki, you've still got all the squatters behind the, the Parliament House. But that seemed to increase when there were more roads put in. Mm -hmm. um, there yeah, was not the infrastructure for the yeah. kids coming in. The, mm -hmm. the rascal, I, I actually sat down with the head of the rascals before, a long time ago, back in the, whatever it was, 1991, yeah. and asked what the hell was going on because prior to then, the kids had come in and they'd be looked after and yes, there was minor crime, but then the international crime guys came in and these guys then couldn't look after these, the youth that had come mm -hmm. into Port Moresby. Mm -hmm. So suddenly it was turning into really hard stuff. And again, yeah. and that's that what's happening is it's escalating. Correct. So how do we get around that? And what is it that the governments can do? Because they have tried, and I know because I've worked with these governments, mm. um, they've tried to do various things, but nothing seems to be working. And having said that, as you said, you know, women over 60, sorry, in Canberra are suffering big time because they're high rate of paralysis. How do we address it as a society, mm. let alone the of it? I mean, I think, you know, that I've worked in PNG as well. I, I worked in Lane and lived in Port Moresby as well. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, the thing that you see is you see the new educated younger people. Right. And so listening to their voice and amplifying their voice, you know, and just seeing how they stood up, you know, on against, you know, sea level rise, you know, like right. they made their voices heard. But they, they never get amplified, you know, like they stand up and they get a bit of kind of media for a period of time, but then no one kind of comes in behind them and helps them navigate to the next stage. And I guess, you know, the politicians, it's human nature, isn't it? They come from very little. Then all of a sudden they've got this injection of opportunity. And so they just kind of become gluttonous, they're gluttonous because yeah. it's like they don't know how long it's going to last, you know? So it's like the kids party, you know, like they're all kind of shoveling in the food, but because they don't know how long it's going to last. And even the ones with the good intentions, they just seem to, it just has become so kind of prevalent that that's the model, you know, it's like once you've gotten in, that's you've achieved and it's not what you do when you get in, it's the fact that you've got in and you stay in is probably. Ever since Peter O'Neill, it's sort of one thing. Sorry, big time. But, but how do you deal with, you're dealing with, with providing housing and, and addressing housing as an issue? And it is about basic Mas Maslow's basic needs mm -hmm. to start with. Mm -hmm. But as you know, you know, the, for example, the, those cement block houses in Hohola, they have upteen families in them and the mm -hmm. one system works well. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't, you mentioned, I mean, there are matriarchal societies and there are, the women do own the land. And, it, in, and the difference is I have, the, in Vanuatu, of course, the more kids you have, the more land you get. Mm -hmm. Marshall Islands, the more kids you have, the more squished you get on the land you have. So how do you get around those sorts of things? They are inherent. I mean, mm. what is your organisation being able to do? Because there's so much need there. What are you able to do to help them? To be honest, we haven't, you know, we haven't actually been long enough in the space to kind of get across all of them. You know, this is, I've been in this kind of role for three years now. And so, um, and then we had kind of COVID and, and yeah. things kind of got pushed back. But um, I mean, I think the Pacific Island Forum is a good kind of conduit. And so, and so, you know, the Pacific Urban Partnership, which we're part of with the UN, is that it used to only kind of come together to organize that conference, which is like a sugar injection, and they get all excited, and then it drops off for two more years. And so that whole thing of like staying in there and putting resources in there, um, and, and even Piango, you know, like that Pacific Island NGO network, you know, they don't get enough support 
and their voices aren't kind of given enough kind of credence either, and, you know, because the solutions are there, but it's just that we have to get over our ego of not thinking that they don't have the answers. That they, they actually, they actually do. They one do. Of, one don't. of the things I, 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 I work across the world these days, in, in particularly in community and economic development, but I've been involved with infrastructure and providing infrastructure and managed the Canadian aid program in certain countries for seven years, and so I dealt with everyone from head of state to remote communities. And they're all different. Mm -hmm. I mean, all these sovereign nations are very different mm -hmm. and they have different issues. And at the same time, they have the exact same yeah, issues. They have the fundamental. That's, and the fundamental. And, and, but, but I've had people say to me, oh, I can't build, we have to then build this. And it's like, well, what do you think they're, they're living in? Yeah, they're that's what I'm saying. Like the skills that you see in the local villages, the trades that they yeah. do have. So, but we, so we don't harness, mm -hmm. nobody's harnessing that. How do we do that? Because they get done too. You know, it's like. They're done too as opposed with. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> right. You know, that's that's the kind of. Yeah, you know that's the kind of approach. You know that's the solution is that we do to you know we'll give you. But we don't know. We don't live there. No, we don't come place. on the other side behind them and say I, I watch them from the other side and say, well, how did you do that? And that's why the I think the Nauru project is quite interesting. Um, and I know the World Bank is sitting in behind Vanuatu in mm -hmm. terms of, and then obviously kind of using technology as well and using some of the lidar because um, they're doing a whole kind of higher ground initiative equivalent in, in Vanuatu as well. Um, but, and they've got earthquakes to go with their sea level rise as well. Yeah, and I think the other, and I think the other thing as well, and, and I had this experience a couple of years ago about sustainability. So um, I think it's about the universities as well and the education system. You know, like how do we talk about the Pacific in schools? What do kids understand about the Pacific? What do people understand in the universities? And you know, when you try and do sustainability projects, you know, and it's it was interesting to see how kind of Australia did it in terms of the government, the government incentives and the banks and the high, you know, the high quality, you know, development partners. But when you go back into the universities and you go back into engineering school and things like that, you find that they actually weren't teaching that. And then mm -hmm. you look at the start of the supply chain of building the houses. And so you've got the architect. And so then you've got, you know, your engineer, you've got your trades, and then you get your builder comes in and, oh yeah, no, we'll have to cut some of that back. And so it all kind of gets lost. And I think that kind of analogy is probably the same in terms of some of the aid projects is that mm -hmm. if we take a different kind of lens to it, and I mean, it'd be great to, like there's more skills and knowledge in this room. And so maybe we kind of just stay a little bit connected and, and keep talking about what, what we might do, you know, with your skills and experience and your relationships and your networks. And so, um, yeah, it'd be great. I think that uh, very often in the first world, we think in terms of having to replicate first world facilities. Whereas the, the truth is that good and good enough is far better than nothing at all. That's right. I'm reminded of practically that, adequate, isn't it? That's right, perfectly adequate. And and what we ourselves were used to until very recently. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we do at Rotary, amongst many others, is try and help with midwifery in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lovely example of that. Um, there's a light, a solar powered light that's made available for midwives. And the slogan that goes with it is. Making babies in the dark is easy. Delivering them in the dark is very hard. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, you, you're never going to provide a, a, a beautiful birthing suite for every woman yeah. who's giving birth in presumably some pretty ordinary circumstances. But you know, at least being able to cast some light on what's going on is yeah. a very good start. Yeah. Having said that, we've also had a program in this city for some years of bringing midwives from the Pacific to be given some midwifery training here so that they go back knowing what they might aspire to, provided they've got some equipment and some funding. Mm -hmm. That seems to me to be the model, mm -hmm. rather than trying to set up in every place that could possibly benefit from it, a full-scale um, hospital and, and pregnancy facility. Yeah. It may not be practical. No, and it's interesting. I mean, it's interesting, it is in New Zealand this week, they kind of announced that they're trying to boost midwives because in New Zealand, the midwife doesn't get paid from where she lives to where the baby is. So she travels, but but anyway, so they're kind of boosting. So what they've decided to do is they're going to make it during school terms and school hours. It's just, it's just so fundamental, isn't it? You know, like before it's like, oh, you had to come like eight to five. But, and so, but also I remember in the Perari River, which is on the Western province, you know, I was doing a social economic impact for the hydropower project and going up into these villages. And there's a, um, a, a there was a center where a lot of the kind of um, babies were kind of born, but they weren't with the witch doctor in the village. 
But um, yeah, so you know, like there's some real kind of pockets of success there, and even where those successes are is to train some of those people in the villages. And and I kind of think you know the the oil and gas sector was a little bit of the kind of industrial revolution for the Pacific because you saw the men, particularly in, in those some of those kind of subsistence places where the men were kind of going off to work there, and now the women were stepping up and they were having a different role than they previously had and different skills than they previously had. And then their kids, the girls were even behind them having different skills. And I think, you know, that's the thing that I noticed going back to PG from different time frames is to see that educated population, but then not enough funding and not enough kind of ampl amplification of what they do and what they know to enable them to become, you know, future leaders. And well, I'm just going to add to that, though, one of the things that always surprised me, I think, yeah, the fact that I was always out of back of the moment, frequently. Um, and, for example, I was in New Island province, which is not really out of back of the moment, but no. in a remote community. And there's everyone sitting around, t-shirts, you know, shorts, singlets, whatever. And this guy starts speaking to me in French. My mm. first reaction was, hang on, what country am I in? Um, and it was because I was... Canadian, uh, but he had come back after five years as a diplomat overseas. Wow. Sitting next to him was the guy who'd been talking very quietly with everybody, an older guy, 20 years before. And these guys, and I found it in many, many communities in different countries mm. where people go home yeah. to the village and actually just bring some of their skills with them and work from underneath. They don't come in and tell people yeah. they're yeah. they are part, it's their home, it's their community. And I want Better people, you know, if you can tap into mm. those people, you just get so much stuff happening and support them. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot out there. And the one thing, I mean, I reckon the Pacific Islanders run rings around us in terms of intelligence. Oh, definitely. They're smarter. They're definitely smarter than a lot of people I know. Yeah, because they, they have to be more wily, don't they? Because mm. they, they have to solve many, many problems to get to, like where we start here, the fundamental problem. They have to kind of negotiate these problems, pre-problems before they get to there. They are also multilingual. Mm. So they look yeah. at they look at the world through a completely different lens and see, as opposed to a monolinguist, and actually look at things much, as you say, much wider mm. and, and understand things that a monolinguist won't. Mm. So, yeah. I thought it would be an interesting night yeah. from this evening was just to kind of stand touch and just explore some of these ideas and see. Time for one more question and I might ask it. Um, you mentioned the uh, Indigenous communities groups from Canada and New Zealand. Are there any similarities or approach as far as uh, solutions to housing uh, difficulties in, in different parts of the world that those Indigenous communities bring per se? Well, I think one of the fundamental ones that they bring is in terms of how they deal with social problems. Mm -hmm. You know, it's that, um, you know, the talking circles and and things like that, and then taking them back to the land and back into mm -hmm. nature is a, is a big part. Um, and, you know, New Zealand kind of has had a mixed history over the last kind of five years, but, you know, the, the amplification of Māori and its approach to solutions, whether it's health or education or, you know, social problems, you know has has really kind of has, has really kind of come up um and so even you know enabling them to have this conversation and 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 vancouver in particular you know um they they're doing great housing you know they've, they've got a real kind of infrastructure of, of um indigenous housing organizations mm -hmm. so i think that's a really important kind of thing as well and another kind of network that we're part of is called the international housing partnership which is canada us australia and the uk and we get together every year in a different kind of location and then we we'll stay in touch in terms of trends and things like that that are happening across our just our different jurisdictions as well which is a good kind of resource network but i think maybe doing that with the kind of younger generation as well and getting more of them involved um is probably something we should be thinking about doing well if there are no further questions we might uh, we might leave it there i think yeah as you've had a long and uh, arduous day getting here i think bernadette we might give you a couple of minutes off Look, thanks uh, so much for uh, giving us a very good look at uh, the housing difficulties in the Pacific, but especially in a variety of solutions that go through. I think what leaps out at me is the uh, collaboration being the way to go, whether it's financial or at uh, conference level. So it's been uh, very, uh, very good to hear from you tonight, and I hope that uh, we can have you back uh, with us on another occasion yeah. to continue the conversation. Yeah, love to. I mean It'd be good to know who's here, you know, to have emails. Oh, well, uh, let's, uh, I'm not saying that people should have to race out the door now, but we'll uh, let our, uh, our uh, people online go.
Uh, and so on behalf of everyone, uh, I'd like to thank you very much for thank coming you. along. Thank you. Thank you.